Okay, so uh, I'm happy uh, to be here, uh, give this series of seminars. Uh, today I'm in Florence, uh, but I hope next time I'll uh, uh, hopefully be able to uh, join at least some of the others in Florence. So, okay, this uh, uh, series of seminars is uh, uh, based on uh, uh, supergravity and um, mostly on the most important one, uh, which is supergravity in uh, dimensions 11. So there are a, a, a huge, there is a huge arena of different uh, supergravity theories, but uh, um, this is somehow considered uh, uh, unique and the uh, uh, most important one. So what I will uh, tell is partly based on some joint works, uh, which I did with uh, Jose Figaro Farin and Paul de Medeiros. Um, uh, but since uh, the topic is uh, kind of uh, not known uh, to everyone, uh, I decided that along the way, uh, there will be um, a certain number of uh, digressions on, uh, uh, on certain objects and definitions that, uh, although not strictly necessary to, to understand the topic, I hope uh, uh, will give a more comprehensive uh, feeling of the framework. Okay, so today uh, I will introduce you uh, uh, supergravity in uh, uh, dimensions 11, its most important uh, features from the point of view of differential geometry. And then we will have our uh, first detour on uh, the super algebra theory. It's a, a beautiful subject, so we will see uh, Katz's uh, classification of uh, simple this for algebras and uh, how to construct. Uh, um, uh, the superalgebra of, in, of interest in, uh, in, uh, in the supergravity theories, which is the Poincaré superalgebra. I will then move to the uh, so-called killing spinor equation, which are uh, a set of uh, partial differential equations on uh, spinor fields, and uh, how uh, to construct concretely uh, out of uh, uh, killing spinor a, a this superalgebra, which is called killing superalgebra. So this will be an extension of the Algebra of Killing Vector Fields in a pseudo Riemannian setting. And if time, time allows, otherwise I will uh, just move it to the second part. I'll give you the first uh, uh, non trivial examples of solution of supergravity theory, namely the uh, so called uh, brain solutions. Uh, just uh, a glimpse of what's coming next time. Uh, in the second part, I will uh, focus more on uh, structural properties of. Uh, Supergravity background. Uh, we see the so-called homogeneity theorem. Uh, we will uh, play with filter deformations, and um, and I will explain how Killing spinors are uh, can be interpreted from a cohomological point of view. And finish with the so-called maximally supersymmetric backgrounds, which are the uh, most important solutions in supergravity. In the last part, I will. Um, focus on uh, uh, supersymmetric backgrounds, which are not maximally supersymmetric, but still have uh, plenty of supersymmetries. So highly supersymmetric backgrounds. Okay, so let me start with the uh, uh, history of supersymmetry, which uh, uh, by obvious reason is uh, incomplete. Uh, supersymmetry is a very vast and huge subject with uh, different uh, realizations. So this is a kind of uh, uh, main uh, uh, milestones uh, that lead uh, uh, to the construction of uh, supergravity. So in the 60s, uh, physicists in uh, uh, their quest of uh, uh, usual quest of unification of forces and uh, 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 fundamental forces ask the following question. If there exists a group which is larger than the Poincaré group whose unitary uh, infinite dimensional irreducible representation contain properly those of the point correct group, but uh, gluing together uh, possibly uh, irrepresentation of the point correct group with different masses and spins. So the first answer to this uh, question was seven years later, and it was a resounding no. It's known by the Coleman Mandula uh, uh, theorem. It's actually uh, a, formulated in the context of. Uh, quantum field theory in dimension four, but it's uh, uh, widely recognized to, uh, to hold uh, in, in generality. So under certain reasonable assumption, they show that 
uh, such a group does not exist. So then other seven, even more, seven years passed, and, uh, and uh, Aglo, Pudzanski, and Sonius came, and they actually said yes. Uh, the, the answer is yes, more or less, uh, in the sense that this requires the introduction of the Poincaré supergroup, group, which is uh, uh, something uh, different. It's uh, not a, a group in the usual sense. And in this case, the irrepresentation uh, indeed break up in uh, irreducible representation of the Poincaré group with the same mass, but different spins. So if the spin is integral, you will have the so-called boson if it is semi-integrals, uh, uh, the fermions. Okay, so these uh, uh, essentially uh, open, paved the way to, uh, to the next development. In 1977, uh, the first square gravity theory was constructed in dimension four by Ferrara, Pittman, and Bunny and Hoisen. And uh, two years later, uh, Nam gave uh, a paper where he classified all the unitary uh, infinite dimensional irreducible representation of the Poincaré supergroup. Uh, in particular, in dimension 11, uh, the, uh, there was a representation with field content given by a metric, uh, a three form potential A, and an object which I will uh, tell you more in the next slide, C, uh, which is called the gravitia. So GA are the bosonic in uh, uh, physics language, and C is the fermionic, uh, uh, in the fermionic data of the of the multiplet of the representation. Okay, so shortly after, Kramer, Yule, and Scherk uh, uh, constructed explicitly uh, the supergravity theory in eleven dimensional in eleven dimension predicted by now. So what they did discover, uh, they uh, discovered uh, uh, an action uh, which is given in the following way. So there are three terms which are classical terms. So we are living on an 11 dimensional Lorentzian spin manifold. Uh, the first term in the action is the usual uh, einstein hilbert action, the integral of the scalar curvature S. Then you have a Maxwell term so F is a closed four form on, uh, on M, and locally you can think of it just being the, uh, the D of the Q form potential A. So here we are in 11 dimensions, so we're doing the wedge of a four form with star of a four form, which is seven. So that gives us uh, honest uh, 11, which we can integrate. And then um, a chan simon term, which is the integral of F, F, and A. So this was the uh, bosonic part of, uh, of the action functional. And then there were extra terms all depending uh, on the gravitino. So the gravitino is a, a one form with values in the spinor bundle SM of uh, my Lorentzian manifold. So I won't define today what, what a spinor bundle is uh, in full detail, but uh, I'll, I'll give uh, uh, some explanation later on for the moment. You just have to think of this as a, a particular kind of vector band over M. Okay, so this action is uh, uh, regarded as one of the crown, crown jewels of modern theoretical physics. And the key point is that this action with uh, the full terms, also those depending on the fermionic uh, part, the gravitino, is invariant not only under local diffeomorphisms, but also some under some kind of uh, special transformation that are roughly speaking, spinorial analogs of the classical diffeomorphisms. These are called supersymmetries in, uh, in theoretical physics. Uh, I won't define them. It's, um, it's, a, it's a tricky point, and uh, it will take some time to do that. Uh, but there is a way to make this uh, uh, mathematically uh, precise. OK, okay so what are the uh, field equations that one gets out of the uh, Lagrangian? So one is interested in the bosonic field equation in the dimensional supergravity. Bosonic means that we are setting the gravitino equal to zero. So the first equation in the game is a Maxwell type equation. So we are doing d star f equal one half f wedge f. Uh, it's an equality of uh, eight forms. And the second one is an Einstein type equation. So you have the uh, Ricci tensor on the left-hand side. And on the uh, right hand side, something which is constructed out of F and the vector X and Y. So the first term is uh, you uh, contract F with uh, X and Y uh, that gives you a T form. 
I will take the uh, inner product of these two two forms using the uh, Lorentzian method. And the other term is just gxy uh, with the square norm of f in front of it. So this is a, a interesting system of coupled PDEs. Uh, uh, note that it's coupled in uh, both equations, of course. Uh, well, f enters in both equations, uh, but also the metric because we have the odd star in the first one. Another key object in the game uh, is, uh, uh, comes from the uh, supersymmetry variation of the gravitino. So remember the gravitino is a one form uh, with values in the spin or bundle. And a supersymmetry is, um, is a, an infinitesimal transformation associated to, uh, to a spin or field. So a section of, uh, of this bundle SM. So this transformational gravitino is, uh, this equation here. So if you vary a gravitino along the spin or field, uh, epsilon, you'll get the, uh, some covariant derivative, uh, D uh, on epsilon plus other terms, complicated ones, uh, which depend on the gravity. So this is a, a linear connection on the spinor bundle uh, and is given by this formula here. And uh, I will explain this in more detail soon. Uh, the first term nabla for me will always be the levis uh, civita connection. And the second term is an algebraic term. You'll see here we have the vector, uh, the four form, or you can think as uh, four polyvector if you want, uh, using the metric. I'm not writing the um, musical isomorphism explicitly. And this dot will be uh, Clifford multiplication. I will, uh, I will tell you what these guys are uh, uh, today. Uh, but the key point is that uh, this is an algebraic part and, uh, uh, and it answers naturally in, uh, in the construction of supergraphic. So the goal of this lecture is to understand this notion and uh, uh, more precisely their interplay. So how this uh, connection on the spin or bundle is related, for example, to the Einstein and Maxwell equation. See the main properties of the supergravity backgrounds. Uh, today we will see how to construct the least square algebra generated from spinor fields, some structural results in the next lectures and the most important examples. Uh, and as I said, along the way, uh, we will digress a bit. So we will see a bit of uh, spin geometry and uh, least square algebra theory. Okay, uh, so let me start uh, indeed with, uh, with least square algebras. Uh, so this algebra is a vector space, G, uh, that has an, uh, an even part G0 and an odd part G1. So it has a parity decomposition. And uh, it's endowed with a, uh, with a bracket. So a bilinear map from G uh, across G to G uh, that satisfies a number of properties. So the first one is uh, uh, compatibility with the parity decomposition. So if you bracket even with even, you land in even, uh, even with odd in, in quad, and uh, odd odd uh, goes back to even. So, so far, this is very similar to uh, infinitesimal version of symmetric spaces, right? Uh, but the key point is that the uh, usual uh, skew symmetry and uh, Jacobi identities are modified. The general rule in, uh, um, in superalgebra theory or in supermanifold is that whenever you have a classical identity and in this classical identity two terms are interchanged, um, if both terms are odd, uh, then an extra sign will appear. So for example, here the skew symmetry uh, relation is modified by this red term. It's minus one elevated by the parity of X and the parity of Y. So if uh, at least X or Y is even, uh, no problem, we get the usual uh, skew symmetry relation. But if both X and Y are odd, uh, we get an extra minus sign. So the bracket between all the elements is actually a symmetric operation, okay? And similarly, uh, the Jacobi identity gets modified. Uh, without the red will be the usual Jacobi identity for the algebras. Uh, but we have Y and X interchange here, right? So it acquires an extra, uh, minus sign. Uh, okay, um, strictly speaking, you have to interpret this equation as being defined on a homogeneous element and then extended by bilinearity. Right? 
uh, three linear equivalent. Okay, so equivalently, a least square algebra can be encoded by the following datum. If you uh, look at the even part, that's uh, honest to the algebra. Uh, G0, G0 lands in G0, and the uh, skew symmetry and Jacobi reduces to the usual uh, uh, axioms of the algebras. If you look at the joint action of G0 and G1, um, our previous axiom tells us that this is a representation. And then we have uh, uh, the bracket uh, between all the elements. So this is a, a map K, symmetric, and the Jacobi identities tells us that it's G0 equivalent. Okay, so, so far uh, it's, uh, um, these are objects that can be uh, described in uh, usual pure linear algebraic terms, but uh, the uh, Jacobi identities for three odd elements still have to be taken into account. So remember if X is odd, XX is not necessarily even, uh, uh, sorry, it's not necessarily uh, zero. Uh, but if you look at this Jacobi identity and you uh, take uh, uh, X equal to Y equal to Z odd, uh, you will uh, actually recognize that all these two terms sum up. So uh, by depolarizing the identity, this is equivalent to X bracket, bracket XX equal to zero. Okay, so this tells us a compatibility condition uh, between the representation row and the symmetric bilinear map K. If you square uh, X via K, and uh, this, this lands in G0, and you let it act on X again, uh, this has to be uh, zero. Okay, some examples. Um, so uh, the usual subs subs suspect, first of all, the general linear least square algebra, GLMN, is defined as follows. You start with, uh, from a vector space, CMN, uh, CM is the uh, even part and CN is the odd one. Uh, so we'll have a parity decomposition and we will write endomorphism as uh, uh, block matrices. Uh, <clears throat> so the uh, diagonal blocks A and D uh, are the even part of your matrix L because they preserve the parity decomposition of uh, CMN. Whereas the off diagonal uh, blocks, uh, B and C, uh, they switch CN with CN. So this will be the odd part of your matrix. And you define your bracket as the commutator, but again, with the uh, rule of sign that I told you before. So if both L and L prime are uh, actually odd, this is not a commutator, but it's an anti-commutator. So for example, explicitly, uh, this is your, uh, here, your matrix L, uh, odd, so only off diagonal entries, similarly for L prime. You do the bracket, you get something even, so uh, with diagonal blocks, and this is constructed uh, uh, from, the, from the blocks B, C, B prime, and C prime in a symmetric manner, not anti-symmetric. Okay, the usual, uh, uh, the, uh, sorry, the relevant notion of trace in this context is the super trace, which is defined uh, for a matrix L as the difference of the trace of A and the trace of D. And this has allows to define the special linear uh, list of algebra as the ideal of the uh, L in GLMN with super trace vanishes. The fact that the super trace is a difference, uh, it's uh, uh, one simple indication that uh, in this algebra theory, some behavior which are actually uh, common of the algebras over fields of uh, non-zero characteristic appears. So for example, if M is equal to N, then the identity uh, as super trace zero, so is uh, in uh, SLMN and is central over there. So SLMN uh, is not really uh, simple and one has to consider the projectivization and quotient uh, uh, the identity out of it. Then there is the orthosymplectic uh, uh, series, which uh, encompasses both the B and D uh, uh, series together, if you want. So we start again with CMN together with uh, an even on the generate supersymmetric bilinear form. So what does it mean? Even just means that, uh, um, that the even and odd part of uh, CMN are orthogonal. 
if R is strict to CM is non-degenerate, if R is strict to CN is non-degenerate, and supersymmetric means that is uh, symmetric in the even part and, uh, and skew symmetric on the odd. So essentially, to be concrete, you may think something of with gram metrics of this kind with identity and the usual uh, J uh, on the odd part. So the orthosymplectic least super algebra is the least super algebra that preserves such a uh, bilinear form. And uh, the block A is uh, SOM. The block D is uh, SP uh, to N. Uh, yeah, sorry, so there is a typo here. Uh, the vector space should be uh, CM to N, of course. Okay. And then the block B and the block C are, are related. Okay, so these two examples are uh, essentially the classical counterpart of uh, what we have in uh, uh, the algebras. Uh, the first example are peculiar of, uh, uh, of the uh, super framework. So let's start with uh, CMN where M is equal to N. Again, endowed with a non-degenerate supersymmetric bilinear form, but now odd. So it's uh, gram metrics will be off diagonal with uh, uh, identities, say, so on the off diagonal. Uh, the least for algebra uh, preserving such uh, bilinear form is called uh, peripletic. And it's this nice least for algebra here. You'll have uh, A, which is any uh, M by M matrix minus A transpose. And uh, off diagonal, you, you will have uh, something symmetric and something skew symmetric here. So if you take um, uh, the super trace of such a matrix, this will be two times the trace of A. Uh, remember, super trace is the difference of the traces. So it makes sense to consider the special peripleptic as the intersection of the peripleptic and, uh, and the SLN. Another strange example is the so-called queer, the superalgebra. Uh, it's again defined on uh, CMN with M equal to N, together with an odd complex structure. So it will be with the uh, off uh, diagonal uh, form, uh, let's say like this, minus identity and identity. And if you consider the least superalgebra preserving such uh, uh, tensor, it's called queer, and it has any uh, matrix A here uh, repeated and any matrix B on the off diagonal. Uh, super trace here is zero. I don't want to enter into details, but there is another natural notion of trace in this context, which at the end of the story boils down simply to uh, take the trace of B. So you can define the special queer as uh, those matrices whose trace of B is zero. And again, uh, the identity still belongs uh, to this guy. So you may projectivize and quotient out by the identity. Okay, last example. Um, uh, this is a least for algebra of vector fields on a purely odd supermanifold. I won't give the definition of a purely odd supermanifold, uh, but hopefully this will be uh, clear enough. So consider uh, the exterior algebra on uh, CM. Uh, this, morally speaking, is your algebra of functions on a purely odd supermanifold. So the coordinates, instead of uh, commuting, are given by the generators of the exterior algebra, so a basis of CM, and they anti-commute. And you want to look at vector fields of, uh, uh, of these functions, so derivations. And at the end of the story, you'll get something like that. So some uh, P alpha, which is uh, a function, so an element of uh, this exterior algebra in front of uh, uh, derivations. The theta one, theta m are uh, my coordinates. Um, so these least super algebras, uh, this one and uh, another similar one appears as a finite dimensional super analog of the least super algebra classified by Cartan of vector fields. Uh, but once you, uh, you make it, uh, this living on uh, on a purely odd supermanifolds, everything becomes finite dimension. So that's why they appear uh, as example of finite dimensional super algebras. The classification is as follows: it was obtained uh, over C uh, by Katz in seventy seven, 
and the finite dimensional simple complex visual algebra split into uh, two main families. So you have the uh, so-called classical ones for which the joint action of the even part and the odd one is completely reducible. And then the so-called Cartan-Lee superalgebra. So uh, we have the uh, WM, which was our uh, last example, and some subalgebras of it. SM is the one with uh, the super vector fields that preserve some uh, appropriate notion of volume form. There exists a deformation of uh, this Lee superalgebra denoted by S tilde, and then you have the Hamiltonian uh, Lee superalgebra. So as I said before, these are uh, super analogs of the primitive uh, the algebras of vector fields classified by Carta. Uh, what about the classical ones? So they consist in, in turn of the two strange examples we saw before, the peripleptic and the queer. And, uh, uh, and then we have the list of those that admit a non-degenerate uh, killing form. So we have the... Um, uh, SLMN and orthosympleptic series. I uh, didn't write this here, but if M is equal to M, uh, if you want to have it simple, remember you have to projectivize. And then we have three exceptional uh, cases. The first one is a one parameter deformation of orthosympleptic for two. So the even part is given by uh, three copies of SL2 acting on uh, the tensor product of uh, the three standard representation. And the parameter alpha uh, enters in how you uh, tweak uh, the bracket of two odd elements taking values in the even part. So there are some coefficients there that you can play with. And at the end of the story, the essential parameter is just one. And the other two exceptional examples are F4, or I started to prefer call it F31 to avoid uh, uh, confusion with uh, uh, the Lie algebra F4. The even part is SO7 SL2, acting on the spin rep tensor the standard, or C2. And then G3, which uh, I already spoke about uh, uh, last year in uh, more than one occasion. So the even part is G2 SL2, acting on the standard the G2 and tensor C2. So somehow what makes uh, the exceptional cases different from the others is that they are uh, not defined as least per algebra preserving some tensor as as is actually the case for all the other ones. So this motivated one, uh, uh, for example, it was one of our motivation uh, with Boris and Dennis to study the realization of G3 as symmetry of objects. Okay, let me finish with some uh, simple exercises on this algebra theory. If you want to have a, a feeling of what's going on, these are uh, nice things to do. So you can define the uh, killing form in the usual way, but you have to remember that um, instead of trace, you have to use super trace. Uh, the exercise uh, asks you to show that the killing form B is even. So uh, essentially the even and odd part of G are orthogonal. It's super symmetric. Uh, so it's symmetric in uh, the super sense with this uh, usual extra sign. So B is symmetric in the even part and it's Q symmetric in the odd. And the next two uh, items ask you to compute the killing form explicitly for SL and OSP. So you'll see that there are some coefficients here in front of, uh, of the super trace of the product and X and Y. And that's why sometimes the killing form vanishes, but you still uh, can replace the killing form by uh, something. For example, here, uh, you just remove this coefficient and uh, uh, you'll get the honest invariant non degenerate. Super symmetric by linear form. And finally, if uh, you have the peripleptic Lie algebra, then show that the killing form is identically equal to zero. So the exercise asks you to do that uh, without computing the explicit. So have a look at uh, this presentation of the peripleptic. Uh, and, and if you think about this, uh, there is a natural uh, Z grading going from minus one to one, which is uh, pretty funny because. Uh, the minus one part and one part uh, have different properties. So out of this, you should uh, be able to prove that the killing form uh, cannot be non-zero. Uh, then some other exercises show that the Levy theorem is not true in general. For example, PSLMM doesn't split inside the SLMM. Derivations are not all inner. 
And finally, uh, semi-simple, this is uh, a bit more difficult. Semi-simple least square algebras are not necessarily uh, direct sum of simple ideals. So there is a hint here. Uh, you need to consider this least super algebra. Here you have theta, which is uh, an odd element, uh, a generator of a one dimensional exterior algebra. L is a simple Lie algebra, and, uh, and you consider uh, the natural structure of Z graded Lie super algebra here, given, for example, L with L theta is just a bracket on L, but it will formally go in uh, the V1, so you keep the odd parameter theta. And then this, this d theta kills the theta, so it uh, sends g1 into g0, and it takes three on g0. So you can see that there is a natural ideal here, but this ideal uh, doesn't have any uh, complement. Okay, uh, so if there are uh, no questions, I will uh, move on and uh, finish this the tour on uh, uh, this algebra here. So let's go to uh, the risk for algebra of interest in uh, the physical theories. We start with a real d dimensional Lorentzian vector space, V eta. Then consider the special orthogonal group, and it admits it's not simply connected, so it admits a double cover spin V. Uh, I won't give all uh, the details today, uh, but the group, the spin group, can be identified uh, inside an algebra. This is the so called Clifford algebra. So the Clifford algebra is a vector space uh, is just the exterior algebra of V. Uh, but the exterior product is modified, is likely modified. Uh, so for example, I would like to share, um, let me see if I can uh, do that. Uh, so Andrea, sorry, may yeah. I ask? Sure. Just, uh, I'm but like you also have classification of a real simple, right? Super algebra. Uh, I mean, there's there is there is also the classification of the real ones. Yeah, of the real forms. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, thanks. Uh, okay, I think I have to stop uh, my share if I want to share with the the tablet. Okay. Okay. Uh, so, uh, what is the multiplication in the uh, Clifford algebra? Let's say you fix a basis uh, E1, ED, orthogonal basis of B. Then, uh, if you do the uh, product of two elements, basis element, which uh, are orthogonal, uh, then this works like in the exterior algebra. It's, uh, it's not the same measure. But for example, if you do the product of, um, of the same element, basis element with itself, uh, this will be uh, minus the norm square of the element. Um, so essentially in the Clifford algebra, uh, you'll have a, a wedge operation, but also a contraction operation. So whenever you can contract, uh, you also have to do that, not only wedge. I'll give the, uh, the more precise definition uh, uh, next times, but um, uh, today we will see how, how to use this and hopefully uh, it will be sufficient. Okay. Uh, okay, uh, so this, um, let me make, okay. Um, so this Clifford algebras, uh, it turns out they are always matrix algebras. For example, in dimension 11, there are two copies of the 32 by 32 real matrices. In dimension four, uh, they are four by four real matrices. So you can consider uh, an irreducible representation S of uh, Clifford Wing, which is called the spinor representation. And since the spin group sits inside the Clifford algebra and uh, uh, indeed also the Lie algebra SOB, 
which you can think of the lambda to uh, b bit uh, inside Clifford. Uh, you also have uh, an action of spin v and uh, sov on s. So this is the spin of representation of the uh, orthogonal of the algebra. So in general, since the Clifford algebra as a vector space is an exterior algebra, I can uh, multiply uh, uh, elements of S with uh, polyvectors on V because these are represented as matrices acting on S. And these are also called Clifford products. So Clifford product is both the multiplication of the Clifford algebra and the action of, uh, of a polyvector on, uh, on S. Okay, let's stick to dimension 11 for concreteness. Uh, it's a simple representation theoretic fact that on S then is an SOV invariant symplectic form, such that if you consider Clifford multiplication by a vector, this is actually uh, anti-symmetric. So you can consider a Clifford action, uh, take a vector, a spinor gives you a spinor, and you can take the transpose of Clifford action with respect to the um, inner product eta on V and the symplectic form uh, on S. So do, due to this symmetry relation, uh, the map that you will get K going from S tensor S to V is actually symmetric. And this is known as Dirac current. So if you want the explicit expression, uh, you take a spinner uh, and how you square it. So how you define, how do you define KSS? Uh, you take the uh, uh, inner product with any vector that gives you a scalar, and this has to be equal to the symplectic product of S and V dot S. So this is a fairly uh, common construction in uh, uh, supergravity, but actually in all uh, supersymmetric field theories. So it gives you a way essentially to uh, regard the spinors as, uh, informally speaking, square root of vectors. So the Poincaré uh, Lisper algebra uh, is the finest follow. Uh, the even part is the Poincaré algebra. The odd part is the uh, spin representation as. Uh, and the non-zero bracket here are given by the uh, commutator on SOB, uh, SOBX, uh, on B, uh, obviously, and uh, on S, we have a spinor representation. And you have, uh, uh, as I said, a, a way to square spinors uh, to vectors using the map K. Okay, so let's go back to uh, supergravity. So remember uh, our setting, 11 uh, dimensional Lorentzian manifold with a close core form F and with a spinor bundle. So a vector bundle whose typical fiber is our uh, spinor uh, module, uh, 32 dimensional vector. So we had the uh, bosonic equation of supergravity, the uh, Einstein type and the Maxwell type ones. And we had also this uh, connection D on, uh, on the spinor bundle, which in the literature is often called uh, super connection. Uh, I just want to mention this because if you get interested in, in these topics, you will uh, uh, see this name, but it's, uh, it's an abuse of, uh, of nomenclature. So it's, uh, it's an honest linear connection uh, on a vector bond. So now I hope this extra term is clear. I'm looking uh, to X as a vector, F, let's say, as a four poly vector. I'm doing multiplication, Clifford multiplication in these two ways. And I let it act via uh, the representation of my Clifford algebra uh, on the spinor uh, module. So this part here is purely algebraic. So a symmetry uh, of a solution of the equation of motion is. Uh, is a pair of objects, uh, Xi, first of all, is the even part. It's a killing vector field for the metric that also preserves uh, the four form. So the e derivative of G and F with respect to Xi is zero. And epsilon is uh, uh, a killing spinor. So for gravity, killing spinor, generalized killing spinors. It's the relevant notion of killing spinor in uh, 11 dimensional supergravity. So a section of the spinor bundle uh, which is in the kernel of uh, the superconnection. So this is a, a 
uh, our first theorem. It dates back to 2005. It was proven by figure of Ariel, Messen, and Phillips. Um, consider the z to graded vector space k, given part k0 and not part k1, made up by the symmetries of a, a solution of the supergravity equations. So the even part are, uh, as I said, are the killing vector fields preserving F and the odd parts are the killing scales. So this object has a natural structure of this parameter called the killing parameter. Um, the simplest and uh, example to have in mind and uh, to all regards, you have to look at this as being the flat model of the theory. Uh, you consider Minkowski space time with f set to zero, then the superconnection uh, just reduces to the uh, Levy Civita. Um, killing spinors are just parallel spinors on Minkowski space time, so uh, you can naturally identify with uh, S. And K0 is just the algebra of all killing vector fields of Minkowski space time because F uh, is not there. In this case, the killing superalgebra is the Poincare superalgebra. So I want to give an idea of the proof. Uh, uh, it's also an excuse to see some uh, uh, nice objects appearing already uh, today, and, uh, and also uh, to see some computation in the field for algebra. So I'll use that the Levi-Civita connection is compatible uh, with a symplectic form on the spinor bundle with Clifford multiplication. Uh, I will employ some uh, uh, identities in the Clifford algebra, and uh, at the last stage, uh, uh, which is interesting, uh, some PDE is associated to some differential forms. Okay, so let's start with uh, uh, K even. Uh, remember, these are the vector fields preserving G and F. So this is clearly algebra, no problem. Uh, and we have also uh, a putative bracket from K1, K1 to K0, given by the Dirac current. So we know how to square spinners. Of course, we have to uh, take care that uh, breaking into elements in K1 will uh, really land in K0, and, uh, and I will show that. But before doing that, what about the action of K0 on K1? Uh, since we don't, uh, we, we don't have an idea uh, at this stage uh, uh, about this, uh, this uh, bracket. Uh, this can be done via uh, the spinorial derivative introduced by Cosman. Um, so that's a way to differentiate any spinor field along uh, killing vector fields. And it's defined as follows. Um, so it's this formula here, uh, there is this tensor A xi. So, uh, so take xi, which is my uh, killing vector field, then A xi is a section of a SOTM. And up to a sign uh, is just minus uh, the covariant derivative of xi. So this tensor AXC can be defined for any vector field. And, uh, and uh, if you have never seen this, it's a nice exercise uh, to show uh, that C is killing precisely when uh, AXC is not just the section of the endomorphous bundle of uh, TM, but is actually in SOTM. So the fact that AXC is in SOTM is precisely characterizing the fact that C is killing. So uh, Cosmos spinorial derivative is defined by uh, taking the uh, levi civita covariant derivative of epsilon along C, and then uh, using this AXC, uh, which is in SOTM point by point algebraically, I have my spinor representation, so I, I let it act on, on epsilon. So there is a way to uh, motivate uh, this definition, of course, geometrically. Uh, I won't do that, but as a kind of, uh, a teaser, let me know, let me uh, make this uh, remark. What happens if we uh, um, take this kind of definition and apply it to vector fields instead of spinner fields? Then I have nabla CX plus uh, my section of SOTM acting via the uh, tautological representation on X. So I have nabla CX minus definition nabla XC. And since the Levy C beta is uh, zero torsion, this is uh, exactly the bracket of X axis. Okay, so this is really just an informal uh, way to, uh, to tell you that this definition is not 
completely out of uh, uh, out of sheer guess. Okay, uh, spinorally derivative satisfies uh, what you would expect uh, from a, a lead derivative. So it's a, a representation. So C and eta are uh, killing vector fields. It's compatible with Clifford multiplication. Uh, so if you do well, C of X dot epsilon, this will be CX dot epsilon and X dotting X epsilon. Um, it satisfies the usual uh, uh, derivation property if you plug in a function in front of epsilon. Uh, and it behaves well with respect to the Levy Civita. So if you commute LXE and double X, uh, this is Nabla of CX. Okay, so it's not uh, uh, difficult at all then to show that uh, K0 act on K K1 via the spinorial derivative. The fact that it's a representation is uh, just this property here, which I left as an exercise. Uh, we just need to convince ourselves that K0 preserves uh, K1. Uh, but this is really straightforward. I'll, uh, uh, I just do it just to give, uh, to give you uh, a feeling. So uh, let's say we start with epsilon, which is our killing spinner. Uh, Xi is our killing vector, preserving F. And I do L Xi epsilon. And I want to check that this is still in K1. So I want to check that this is uh, uh, still a killing uh, spinner. So I'll do nabla X of this guy. First of all, I use the uh, commutation property of uh, levi civita and Spinorial uh, Cosman derivative. So this term will become these two terms. And, uh, and then I'll substitute the fact that epsilon is uh, killing spinners. So remember, uh, that means me in the kernel of uh, this covalent derivative. <clears throat> so this term here, nabla x epsilon, will be substituted by this and nabla cx epsilon by this guy. Then I'll focus on the first, lx is compatible with Clifford multiplication. So I'll bring lx as a derivation on each of these terms. When lx lands on x, it will actually cancel uh, the second term that I have here. So it remains lx on, uh, on the f and lx uh, sorry, LC on the F and LC on, uh, on the epsilon. And in the last step, I just use that C is not just the killing vector, but it also preserves F. So this, uh, cont the first contribution here is uh, uh, vanish. So I'm left with the second contribution that tells me exactly that LC epsilon is a killing spinner. Uh, it's also easy to see that the Dirac current is equivalent. Uh, uh, not sure if I have time to do it. Uh, maybe I can. Uh, maybe I can. I can skip this. Uh, I, I can go back to to this data in case. Um, so what? Uh, so let's take for granted that the Dirac current is equivalent. Is uh, it's a similar computation. It remains to show that the Dirac current uh, really takes values in K0. So it takes values in killing vector field preserving F. And it remains to check this compatibility condition that I mentioned before in the construction of uh, Lisper algebras, uh, which is equivalent to the order of Jacob identity. So first of all, let's prove that if I square a killing spinner, I uh, get a killing vector. So I want to show that nabla xi, where uh, xi is uh, uh, the vector fields constructed as a square of epsilon is killing. So I want to show that nabla xi is a section of SOTM. So I want to show that this object is Q-symmetric in X and Y. So let me substitute uh, the fact that xi is uh, the square of a spinner here. Uh, I'll then use that. Um, uh, Dirac current is a parallel operation, so the nabla will go inside. Uh, the two terms will uh, coincide uh, because k is symmetric, so I'll get a two. Uh, then I substitute that epsilon is a killing sphere. So I'll get two terms. Uh, apart from these coefficients, I'll get x dot f dot epsilon, and uh, uh, the other term was the other way around, f dot x dot epsilon. 
uh, okay, so both terms here in, uh, in the parentheses are vectors, right? Uh, and I'm taking the, uh, uh, the G of them. So let's use the definition of Dirac current. Remember that was the transpose of Clifford multiplication. Uh, so this term here uh, is the symplectic uh, inner product of this pin or here and this pin or epsilon where I bring the y dot in front of it. That was just the definition of people of uh, the current uh, uh, that I gave here. That was at, at the algebraic level. Now uh, it's uh, uh, for uh, killing vectors and killing spinors, but uh, that's the same. Uh, Okay, and similarly for the other, it's uh, f dot x dot ep, uh, f dot x dot epsilon, symplectic product of y dot epsilon. Then I can bring the y on the other side uh, uh, because Clifford multiplication by vector is Q-symmetric. So I get this term, and again, I'll bring the y uh, here. Okay, now we need some observation uh, because we have a four form f, uh, I remember inside the Clifford algebra, uh, we can do uh, both contractions and wedges. These are inside the Clifford multiplication. So for example, I can take F and wedge by Y and X, or I can contract uh, by Y and X, or I can contract by X and wedge by Y or conversely. So the net result of Clifford multiplication is uh, four, uh, contrib uh, four contribution. One contribution, uh, which is a differential form of degree six, when I uh, wedge with y and x. One, which is a differential form of degree two, I contract both times. And uh, two contribution, which are uh, still differential forms of degree four. So now we use this representation theoretic fact that the second symmetric power of S is isomorphic to lambda one, lambda two, and lambda five. There is an odd duality here look, lurking around. So you can think this uh, honestly also as lambda 10, lambda nine, and lambda six. Whereas the skew symmetric of S is zero, three, and four. So uh, this means that if I say contract with X and wedge with Y, I'll uh, still remain with the four form, but this is Q-symmetric. So here I have epsilon and epsilon. So this uh, contribution uh, is not there. It's automatically vanished. So what I can do is either contract with Y in X or either wedge with Y in X. And I'll do this for both time, for both terms. So the net result is clearly uh, Q-symmetric and X and Y. Uh, so Nabla C is a section of SOTM and uh, C a killing vector field. So, so far was the easy part of the proof. Uh, the remaining uh, things to check are uh, uh, more difficult, but uh, I'll give you still an idea of what's going on. So uh, it remains to show uh, that if I square uh, killing spinors, I get some vector field that also preserves F. So to, uh, to prove this, um, we need to use this representation theoretic fact here. This is the composition of the second symmetric power of S at the geometric level. So the lambda one bit is just the Dirac current. But these isomorphisms tell us that I can construct also two form and a five form in a similar uh, fashion. So let's focus on the two form that I can construct quadratically out of epsilon, which I call omega two. So it's defined as follows on X and Y, I'll uh, take the wedge of X and Y, I let it act by Clifford multiplication on epsilon and take the symplectic in the product with epsilon itself. So this is completely analogous to the uh, definition of uh, the current for one vector but now we have to. Since epsilon is a killing spinner, uh, an interesting uh, uh, consequence is that the two form is uh, not generic, but it satisfies some interesting degrees. Uh, I will be back on this in the uh, last lectures, but uh, for the time being, 
uh, I need to uh, trust me that uh, there are some PDEs that are satisfied by omega-2. And the one of them is the following. If I take the uh, D of omega-2, that's a three form, and that's equal to uh, the four form contracted by the Dirac current up to a sign. So if I do LCF and use uh, Cartan uh, formula, I'll get these two contribution. Uh, the second one disappears because F is closed. And in the first one, I can substitute IXCF with minus the omega two. So I'll get to this term, which is zero because uh, the square is zero. Okay, so it remains the odd dot the identity, which is uh, really the most difficult uh, thing, not surprisingly, uh, to check. So it, what, I, what I will say now will be a bit of waving ends. Uh, but let me at least motivate uh, the fact that the problem reduces to uh, an algebraic one. So remember the other dot compatibility, uh, the other dot identity, Jacobi one, uh, is equivalent to the uh, compatibility condition. So it means uh, I take a spinner, I square it, I let it act uh, again on the spinner, this has to be zero. So in our terms, it means I consider C, uh, the Dirac current of. Uh, K, and I let it act on epsilon again via the spinorial data. So I do Nablax epsilon plus AX epsilon. That was the definition of uh, Cosman. I use that epsilon is a killing spinor, so substitute this with this algebraic term. And then I focus on the endomorphism AX uh, of the M. So instead of using the spinner representation, so uh, instead of letting the XE acting on uh, epsilon, let us see what's going on if I uh, consider it as an endomorphism of uh, TM. So I let it act on, on a vector. So by definition, this is minus nabla X XE. I substitute K epsilon epsilon to XE. Again, I bring uh, 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 let me see with hand side. And I use that epsilon is a killing spinner to uh, substitute nabla x epsilon with this term here. So the net uh, observation is that uh, this term here in the uh, spinorial derivative depends only algebraically on epsilon. I have this epsilon here and I have xi, which also depends on algebraically. And a xi also uh, depends uh, only algebraically on epsilon. So at the end of the story, showing that LC epsilon is equal to zero boils down to uh, an algebraic problem. And one can check that this is true. Uh, the computation is simplified by the following uh, general observation, which was uh, uh, first uh, uh, established by Figueroa Farrell and Bryant. If you uh, look at the orbits of the spin group uh, on the projectivization on, uh, of the spin of representation, uh, then there are essentially only two orbits. Uh, so here, this algebraic equation is spin V equivariant. So you need to check this just for one representative of one orbit and one representative uh, of the other one. Uh, but it, this involves more complicated identities in the Clifford algebra. So uh, I won't do this. Uh, okay. So I think I'm uh, uh, <coughs> mostly on time and uh, I would like to finish with uh, two examples. Uh, can you please tell me if the slide is uh, sufficiently big or uh, is it uh, visible in a reasonable way? Yeah, 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 it's, it's perfectly fine for me. Okay, okay. Okay, so these uh, uh, solutions are called uh, elementary brain solutions and uh, physically, uh, you have to look at uh, my picture here at the bottom of the uh, slide. It's not the most illuminating one, but uh, so here in blue, uh, I have my P brain, which you, uh, you have to think as a, as a black object, some kind of not necessarily black holes. I mean, we are speaking of theories in 11 dimensions, so everything is uh, conjectural. But uh, you have to think of being a, a, a black object in P uh, space-time dimensions. 
plus one time, so a, an R1P, okay? So my manifold will be uh, uh, the coordinates of my brain, including time, then coordinate row, uh, positive R, which tells me the distance from uh, uh, the brain, from these black objects, and then the sphere, a, a, a nine minus, phi, minus P dimensional sphere that surrounds uh, the brain. So the ansatz for this kind of solutions uh, for the metric uh, is as follows. You consider the flat metric on R1P and the flat metric on this other uh, factor just written in spherical coordinates. And, if, and you multiply, uh, it's not really a work product. Uh, you multiply both factors by, by some power alpha and beta of a, of a function H. H is an harmonic function on, uh, uh, on this uh, bit here, which is R10 uh, minus P, purely Euclidean. Uh, <clears throat> that only depends on the distance row from the brain. So it's a function of this, of this form. Um, and then the answer, we also have an answer on, uh, on F and star F. Uh, we ask that either F or star F is given by this formula. So that's the wedge of the volume form of the uh, R1P of the brain space, uh, wedge uh, up to a sign, uh, uh, the D of uh, H minus one. Okay, so if this is the form that uh, is, is supposed to have F, uh, it means that it has to be a four form. So this means that P is equal to, right? So that here we get a three form and this is always a one form. So this will give rise to the so-called uh, uh, M2 brain solution. If on the other hand, we insist that star F is not this form, uh, then this volume has to be a uh, six uh, form. And so P has to be five and one uh, lens to the so-called M5 uh, brain solutions. Uh, the number alpha and beta has to be uh, are real numbers and have to be uh, determined via the equation of motions. So I'll save you the computation, but if you uh, want, you, you, you can do them uh, as an exercise. Uh, so if P is equal to, we are in the M2 brain case, uh, the Einstein and Maxwell equation select uh, these values for alpha and beta. And, uh, and here is the metric that you get. Uh, it's just the metric in the previous slide where I have explicitly substituted uh, the harmonic function H, which was A plus B over uh, the total power of, of rho, elevated to alpha and similar thing for the other. Uh, term. And F is, uh, is this form here. Uh, so physicists like to think of this brain as having an electric charge uh, given by integrating uh, the seven form star F on the surrounding uh, sphere of the brain, which in this case is seven dimensional, uh, ascending the sphere uh, at infinity. So we're all going to infinity. Uh, the other solution is the M5 brain solution. In this case, the equation of motion uh, uh, fixes these uh, other two coefficients. Uh, and here is the uh, uh, form of the metric with, uh, with the explicit uh, harmonic form substituted in, uh, uh, harmonic function substituted in the answer. Um, and in this case, uh, uh, it's taught this brain to have a, a magnetic charge. In this case, you integrate uh, the four form F on the surrounding sphere, which is four dimension, and send this at infinity. Um, so uh, roughly speaking, uh, you can take two limits uh, for each of these two solutions. Uh, you can send rho uh, at infinity, or you can send rho uh, to zero. So you can uh, uh, approach uh, the horizon. Um, so the limit uh, 
for rho uh, going to zero is the so-called near horizon geometry. And this metric here, if you uh, send rho to zero, or uh, you can easily convince yourself that's the same as uh, sending a to zero, uh, you'll get these uh, uh, two solutions, uh, well, these two spaces here for the moment. For p equal to two, a is four as seven, and for p equal to five, a is seven as four. Um, whereas if you uh, if you go at infinity, uh, in both cases, uh, you're sending b to zero, and in both cases, you, you will recover Minkowski space time. So this brain solution were the first uh, uh, important and non-trivial solution they were discovered in the beginning of the 90s. And uh, for generic values of A and B, uh, they admit exactly 16 key spinners. So half the maximum possible number of key spinners. Uh, but for the above special limits, we will see in the next lectures that uh, this number uh, increases. And then we will also see that this 16 uh, is kind of a threshold for uh, many interesting uh, structural properties of uh, supergravity solution. So um, if you have more uh, than 16 killing spinors, uh, your structure becomes uh, more rigid and uh, essential structural properties of uh, supergravity background can be uh, inferred in general. But uh, I plan to uh, speak about this uh, in uh, the next two lectures. So uh, I will stop here. <coughs> Thank you very much. Questions from Andrew? So you say that, that uh, in special cases there are more than 16. So what is the number? Uh, so, so of course, uh, we are speaking of killing spinners. So this is a, a parallelity condition for, uh, for the connection. So the maximal number is uh, the dimension of the fiber, which is 32. And uh, next time we will see uh, what's going on with uh, 32. Uh, there are some gap results, which uh, I was hoping to have time to, uh, to give my proof of the gap, which uh, sits very much in line with uh, our topic so far. Uh, but unfortunately, I, uh, it, it's really impossible. I, I, I don't have time. But there are some gap results. And um, uh, in general, uh, uh, I, I will be more precise uh, next time, but in general, uh, if you uh, stay under 16, uh, even if you stay uh, in the realm of uh, supergravity solution with even one killing spinos, solution becomes really uh, very abundant. It's, uh, uh, it's not difficult to construct them. Uh, but if you have more than 16, things become more rigid. And, uh, and 24, even more than 24, seems to be another uh, critical point in the sense, well, at least uh, above uh, 24, uh, if you uh, exclude the maximally supersymmetric backgrounds, namely those with uh, 32 killing spinners, above 24, there is only one, uh, only one single other example known at all. So <clears throat> uh, my, interest, uh, my interest, I would say it's, uh, uh, you, you will see next time, but it's uh, uh, mostly uh, devoted to uh, more than 60. And I personally find more than 24 uh, to be the uh, even more interesting uh, part. Um, so I, I have a question. Yeah. Uh, so th thank you, uh, Andrea, for uh, your interesting talk. So at, at some point you, you mentioned that there were uh, two orbits um, 
in the projectivization of uh, spin space on the, the special orthogonal group. That's right. So I guess what, what one of these orbits is uh, the space of pure spinners up to scale. Um, and then the other ones are just generic. You can call them generic, I guess. So uh, yes, in this case, uh, they are distinguished by the uh, causal type of the uh, Dirac current. Yeah, okay, so so it, so that would mean that if the if you know that the Dirac current uh, vanishes, then most of the other uh, uh, differential forms arising from this uh, from this spinner bilinear forms vanish as well, except for one. That I, if it's if the spinner uh, is pure, that that would be the definition. Uh, uh, yeah, perhaps uh, okay. I think you're right, but. Uh, uh, I should double check that. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, yeah, okay. I mean, I'm, I'm pretty sure that this is correct from oh, Clapton's theory, but uh, actually, what I didn't know was the number of orbits. So it seems to be either very, you know, very generic, or it's simply uh, a pure uh, uh, it, It's it's generic, but it's not an open orbit. Huh? Oh, oh, okay, okay. Yeah, uh, I, I see, I see. So there might not. still be conditions. I, I, okay, I'm not sure. So, yeah, so yeah. you get, you get uh, different types of geometries according to whether your spinner is... Yeah, 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 yeah. So there are two uh, very nice paper from uh, a physicist uh, in the middle of the 2000s. Uh, and they started um, supergravity solutions with one kilo spinos. And uh, one article is dedicated to the case where the uh, Dirac current of the Killing Spinos is, uh, uh, so the Dirac current is, you can show that is always causal. So it's either uh, time-like or light-like. Oh, okay, okay. And uh, the first article is devoted to the uh, time-like case and you get certain uh, kind of geometries. And the second one is devoted to the light-like which uh, I think you get a certain number of geometries which are very close maybe to the one you, uh, uh, that could be of interest for you uh, indeed, actually. Okay. So, so in a, in a light-like case, would that mean that the, uh, the, the spinner field is covariantly constant with respect to the Levi-Civita connection or is it a bit different? No. No, no, okay, no. so it could still be. No, 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 no. This, this extra term, so, this extra term here uh, makes things uh, uh, complicated and interesting at the same time. Uh, mm -hmm. The main reason is that this term here, uh, these algebraic terms on, with which we deform the Levi Civita, it uh, uh, <clears throat> doesn't come from any uh, metric connection. So there are supergravity theories in which these uh, extra algebraic terms can be reformulated in terms uh, not as a Levi Civita plus something, but some metric connection with Tosh. Okay, okay. But in 11, in 11 dimensional supergravity, this is not possible. This is honestly a term that lives in the Clifford algebra. It doesn't come from, uh, that doesn't come from uh, the Spinoria, that doesn't come as, as, as the Spinoria lift of a metric connection is, is an honest spinorial connection. But uh, you, so. Okay, because, because you, you had this formula at some point, you said that the, uh, the two form arising from the, uh, the spinner field is equal to, well, the, the vector field arising from the spinner field inserted into F. Uh, so I thought there was some connection. Yeah, yeah, this, uh, this. Uh, so yeah. it, it does not have an impact on this second term of the uh, of the uh, well this connection. Uh, I mean, it's not clear to me in in any you, case. You mean? Uh, yeah, on this. You yeah. mean on this term here? Yeah. Uh, right. uh, sure. Uh, sure. It Yes, uh, there are a lot of integrability conditions in this game, and uh, uh, and they are not, uh, and not all of them are even known. Uh, I'm afraid. Uh, okay. 
uh, but yes, I mean, uh, in, in the last lectures, I'll show how to use this uh, in, uh, together with the Kidney Spinoz equations uh, okay. to get some, uh, some results on, uh, on your background. Yeah. But, okay, but I guess when the, the spinner is pure, both sides of this equation uh, vanish. I, yeah. uh, I'm not sure, Arman. Maybe I'm not sure. Well, okay. Uh, uh, maybe I can I can double check and I'll uh, uh, let you next time. Uh, okay. Okay. Uh, okay. I, I would say no, but uh, but let me check. <laughs> okay. 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 Thank you. Thanks. Any other questions for Andrea? So if not, let's uh, thank him for the for his first lecture. Thank you very much.